Hello, everybody. Welcome to Science Division Live. My name is Joe Sertich. I'm the curator of dinosaurs at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And today I'm going to share with you a bunch of the new research that we've been doing at the museum focused on dinosaurs from the lost landmass of Laramidia. So we've been working all across the Rocky Mountain West from Utah to Montana, and these fossils are some of the newest, freshest dinosaurs that have come out of the ground. And so I'm going to start up my screen right now. And I'm excited to show you all of our new finds from all around the country. There we go. All right. So again, I'm really excited to show you a bunch of these new dinosaurs. I have a lot of pictures to show you today. Um, and uh, really, I'm excited to get your questions. So hopefully, as I'm talking through these, you compile a bunch of cool questions about new dinosaurs or dinosaur discoveries you've heard about in the news recently, and I'm excited to answer those questions as well. So a lot of you have probably heard of the lost landmass of Laramidia, but if you haven't, here's a good picture of what it looks like. So Laramidia was a strip of land during the late Cretaceous uh, that was separated from the rest of North America by a big seaway called the Western Interior Seaway. So you see the big seaway there with the outlines of states. Uh, this seaway covered most of the Great Plains region uh, from the Arctic all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And if you look at the little scale bar at the top, these are the dinosaur time periods, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And if you're familiar with dinosaurs of the Rocky Mountain region, you probably know about dinosaurs from the late Jurassic, things like Stegosaurus and Allosaurus. And also probably the last dinosaurs, things like Triceratops and T-Rex. And Laramidia time sits right in between them toward the T-Rex time right around 85 million years ago to about 72 million years ago. This is the, the time of Laramidia. And this time was full of dinosaurs that look pretty familiar to you. So this is what I call the big four. So T-Rex's cousins, so the big tyrannosaurs you see there in the middle. Also duckbill dinosaurs, horned dinosaurs, and armored dinosaurs. You see over there on the left, a little armored dinosaur. And these dinosaurs have been discovered from the Rocky Mountain West uh, for really the last 100 to 120 years, so they're really well known. And most of those discoveries have come from these rock units right around the Canadian and northern Montana area. So in southern Alberta, we have two different rock units that have produced really amazing dinosaurs. And here in the U.S., on the U.S. side of the border, we have a couple of rock units in Montana that have produced these dinosaurs. But over the last 20 or 30 years, Major new discoveries have been coming out of the south part of Laramidia. This includes places in Utah, New Mexico, and Texas. And then in between these yellow stars are some relatively unexplored parts of Laramidia. So if you're a future paleontologist, you want to be a dinosaur discoverer, these are places you're going to want to go in the future because they're going to produce some really amazing new dinosaurs. This is what the rocks of Laramidia typically look like. These are areas that we call badlands. So badland is an area of, of rock that's exposed in these really deeply incised valleys and steep hills. They're called badlands because they're really hard to get into. They were the bad areas for ranching, for farming. And so they were often just left alone. And these are some of the best places in the world to find dinosaur bones. Here's a, a map again of the areas of Laramidia where we find dinosaurs. If you look on the far left of the screen, you see time. So those numbers are millions of years ago. And all of the gray bars in the middle are the time periods that these rocks were deposited. So if you want to know when a certain rock was deposited in Montana, you can look at the bar here. It's between 74 and 79, for example. So I'm going to refer to this diagram a couple of times through this talk. And here at the Denver Museum, we've been working in several of these different rock units from northwestern Colorado all the way down to partners in the Big Bend area of Texas, right on the Texas-Mexico border. And again, here are some of the rocks. This is uh, our crew hiking out to some of our sites in the Kaparowitz Formation in southern Utah. So here you see the little specks in the middle. That's our crew of volunteers and scientists walking out in the morning. It's really hard to get to some of these sites. So here's a, an example of the roads we have to drive on. This was a, a, a spot where I actually slid off the road and it took us about six hours to get the truck out of the, the hole here. Lots of hard work. We have to hike in all of our equipment. This is a rock saw that we use to cut really 
uh, really big dinosaurs out of very, very hard sandstones. Everything has to be hand carried from the field. So all of the bones are coming out here on stretchers. And when we're really lucky, we get to use things like helicopters. So every year for some of our really remote work in Laravidia, we were able to put dinosaur jackets. So that big white blob contains the skull of a duckbill dinosaur. We're able to put those onto uh, nets that helicopters carry out for us. And it's all worth it because these dinosaurs are amazingly preserved. So here you see an impression of skin from a duckbill dinosaur in southern Utah. Um, that uh, pocket knife in the middle is for scale, but to the right you see the little bumps and grooves. That's the scales on the, the outside, probably the neck area of a duckbill dinosaur. We're finding some of the first evidence of nesting from southern Laramidia in some of these sites. So these are dinosaur eggshells from a, a new nest site that we've collected. And these probably belong to a large oviraptor type dinosaur based on the structures of the eggshells. And we also get other parts. So we're not just dinosaurs. We get things like turtles and snakes and lizards, uh, amphibians, birds, everything that lived alongside the dinosaurs. So here you see a couple of gigantic tortoise-like turtles coming out of the ground. These were probably large herbivorous turtles that behaved a lot like a tortoise today. So if you've seen a Galapagos tortoise or some of the other big tortoises, this is a turtle that looks a lot like a tortoise. And the aim of our work isn't just to find dinosaurs, it's to reconstruct ecosystems. And so we're after things like the plants, the geology, so understanding the muds and the sands, the depositional environments is really important to our work. And we're able to paint these really detailed pictures of what life was like at any one of these different rock units. One of the rock units that I've been working in for the past 16 years now is called the Caparos Formation. This is in southern Utah. And a lot of these dinosaurs have been named recently, but within the last 10 years, almost all of these dinosaurs have been described from the Kaparowitz Formation. And what's really neat about the Kaparowitz Formation is it gives us a look at what's going on in the south at exactly the same time as a really well-known dinosaur deposit up in southern Alberta, up in Canada. So that blue star at the top of the map is where these dinosaurs have come from in Canada. And the red star is the Kaparowitz Formation in southern Utah. So all of these dinosaurs lived 76 million years ago, so about 10 million years before T. rex and Triceratops. So these are the great great grandmothers of T. rex and Triceratops. And this is a really great place for us to make comparisons. And over the last 20 years or so, we've come up with some really neat ideas called uh, dinosaur endemism. So this is the idea that uh, certain dinosaurs only lived in certain parts of Laramidia. So far, there have been 11 dinosaurs recognized from the Kaparowitz Formation. This runs that whole range of the big four, so tyrannosaurs, horned dinosaurs there in the middle, and then duckbill dinosaurs and armored dinosaurs up at the top of the screen, along with lots of other small dinosaurs, so things like little raptors and the uh, ostrich mimic dinosaurs have all been recognized from the Kaparowitz Formation. By far, the biggest stars of the Kaparowitz so far have been the horned dinosaurs. So things like Utah Ceratops, Cosmoceratops, and Nasutoceratops, even though they're not household names necessarily, these are some of the most bizarre horned dinosaurs that ever lived with crazy horns pointing in different directions. Um, and the neatest thing I think about these horned dinosaurs is what, they, what they've told us about that theory of endemism. So the idea that they lived in different places. When we compare the dinosaur park formation in Canada to the south, to the Kaparowitz formation, we see some differences. Here, the duckbill dinosaurs you can see are similar. So we have a cre tube crested Parasaurolophus there at the bottom, but they're two different species. And at the top, we have the bump nosed Gryposaurus, but again, they're two different species. And to this point, we're still missing that middle type of duckbill dinosaur, the, the cask headed or the, the crest headed duckbill dinosaur from the south. Same for the horned dinosaurs, completely different. And even at this level, they're not the same genus. That means they're completely different, even though they lived at the same time. So what that has told us is there's something going on between the north and the south, where we have different dinosaurs living on a small landmass. It's about one fifth the size of North America today. But they were able to live in small areas um, at the same time from south to north. And the big mystery is what's going on to make that happen. What is either dividing these different dinosaur populations? Is there a big mountain range that separates them? 
Did the seaway come all the way in and separate them, big river systems? Or is it just some natural latitudinal gradient? So is it similar to what we see today with animals from the subtropics and tropics? So say or, uh, animals that live in Mexico aren't the same types of animals that live up in, in Canada. So that's just a normal gradient, ecological gradient from um, latitude, from climate. So the big thing I want to share with you today are some of the new dinosaur discoveries that are helping us understand that gradient, helping us understand why there are different dinosaurs in different places. In the Kaparowitz, really since I started at the Denver Museum more than nine years ago, we've been making major new discoveries of dinosaurs that are just now getting to the stage where we can describe them. This is one of the first ones we found in 2011. This is a duck-billed dinosaur core. You can see the orange uh, bones in the in the lower part of the screen. Um, these are duck bill leg bones. And this site has produced at least two individuals of small crest-headed uh, duck bill dinosaurs. So these are the bones after they've been prepared down in our facility uh, at the museum waiting to be cataloged and described. And based on some of our initial investigations, we've seen that this type of dinosaur is that missing cask-headed dinosaur from the south. So remember, we had three on the left and only two on the right. This new discovery fills in that missing type of dinosaur. We probably don't have enough to give it a new name. We only have little fragments of the skull, so we don't know exactly what it looked like. We do know it was pretty small compared to the northern forms. Uh, we've done the work. We've cut some of the leg bones and looked at the age. And it looks like a fairly mature individual at a very small size. And what that does is allow us to then say that this type of dinosaur, which was only known from the north, is also present in the south now. So um, that big hole, that big difference between north and south is now being filled with a new discovery. We have a similar story with another little type of plant-eating dinosaur. So here in the middle of the screen, you see some kind of pinkish colored small dinosaurs. One of them has either slobber or water dripping out of its mouth. This is called an orodromine. This is a small plant eater that was really well known from the north. And we've been able to recover several partial skeletons of this new type of dinosaur, and we're working on naming this dinosaur right now. It's a really exciting find. Uh, we have lots and lots of bones from at least six or seven individuals, all the way down to little babies, the size of kittens that could have sat right in your, the palm of your hand. And again, what that does is take a, a group of dinosaurs that we thought were only in the north and extends them down into the south. And so to this point, We've known them from a lot of these northern localities and now the Kaparowitz formation in the south. Horn dinosaurs, again, are some of the, the big rock stars of this time period. And we are already well over the normal average for horn dinosaurs in a single unit. We had three different types of horn dinosaurs living in the Kaparowitz, whereas at any given time period in the north, there's usually around two. So we were surprised a couple of years ago to find a brand new type of horned dinosaur at the same level, the same rock level as the other horned dinosaurs. This is a glimpse of our new discovery. This is a type of horned dinosaur with big horns over the eyes and big horns along the back of the frill that doesn't compare with the other ones. It's definitely not the other type of dinosaur. And usually when you hear about dinosaur discoveries in the news, uh, it's based on a couple of fragments. So there was a big discovery last week of some new dinosaurs from New Mexico. And those new dinosaurs, one of them called Navajo Ceratops, was based on one little chunk of the back of the shield, the frill behind the head. We're really lucky in the Kaparowitz in southern Utah because we have tons and tons of fossils. So here you see this new dinosaur represented by seven partial skulls. And these skulls go from little juveniles, so up in the upper left is a little juvenile or subadult, all the way to really mature adults. So not only is this uh, are we confident this is a new dinosaur? We can actually compare uh, different stages of its growth to other dinosaurs. And so this is what's really unique about Southern Laramidia, having so many great fossils. So rather than three in the south and two in the north, we now have four in the south and two in the north at any given time. Crazy diversity. And what we've learned uh, based on some of these discoveries is there is definitely a southern group called the Pentaceratops group of horned dinosaurs. And so no other formation has uh, typically more than one of this type of dinosaur. But there in the Kaparowitz, you see we have three of this type of uh, horned dinosaur called a chasmosaurine at the same level, so at the same rock unit. We're looking at the same ecosystem. 
So what really blew us away a couple years ago was the discovery of this site. So here you see some dinosaur bones still in the ground. Uh, this is the shoulder blade on the left, some of the upper arm bones on the right, and then the, the face is down toward the bottom of the screen. Some of those flat bones are the cheekbone and other parts of the frill. And so far, early stages of prep, so cleaning of these bones, has shown us that this also looks different from the other dinosaurs that we know from the Comparowitz. There's always been a mystery Comparowitz horned dinosaur that we've always called Centrosaur B. And we think that this new discovery of at least three individuals represents another new horned dinosaur. So that means rather than two versus four, we actually have five versus four horned dinosaurs from the Comparowitz versus the Northern Dinosaur Park formation. We have other things like new raptor dinosaurs. We have new bird-like dinosaurs that had really big brain capacity. We have new tyrannosaurs. So the, the world of dinosaurs and the comparables is really exploding. And when you look at some of the other animals, so things like crocodiles and lizards, things we call the paleothermometers of the Cretaceous, things that relied on the temperature of their surroundings, we see other things. So here's a new gator in this picture. And these new gators go all the way up to gigantic sizes. So this is Dinosuchus, one of the largest crocodiles that ever lived. Uh, here it is attacking a, a Tyrannosaur from Laramidia. And when we compare things like crocodiles, we see another big difference, a lot like the horned dinosaurs, where we have six very distinct taxa, different types of crocodiles and alligators from the south, versus only two up in the north. When we look at lizards, we get a really similar pattern. So lizards have a, a really interesting distribution. These are all little tiny fossils about the size of uh, a grain of sand that we've picked out of microsites. So there you see various jaws with teeth, uh, the front of the snout with teeth. And when we map these out, we see that their distributions are also very different and tied maybe to latitude, which is what you would expect for an animal that relies on external temperatures, uh, latitudinal gradients. Uh, to get by. And then by looking at the plants, we've also started to piece together a part of this puzzle. So this is the dinosaur's food, of course. This is the base of the food chain. And the diversity and types of plants present in these areas, also the indicators of climate that they contain, have shown us that there's some differences between north and south. So plants are really key to understanding what's going on and why we have different communities up in Canada and northern Montana from what we have down in, in Utah. So, so far, there are nine new species of dinosaurs out of the 11 recognized from the Comparowitz. And based on discoveries from the Denver Museum, but also our collaborators at the Natural History Museum of Utah and the BLM, so the, the Grand Staircase National Monument BLM Paleontology Program, we're adding another 10 new species based on discoveries that are already back in our museums and our labs. So this is now becoming one of the best known dinosaur units anywhere in the world. We also work on some of the other rocks in the area. So to really understand what's going on, we want to look up and down in time. So we want to go back in time. We go back to what's called the Wawit Formation. So far, the Wawit Formation has produced five named dinosaurs. That includes a big tyrannosaur called Lithernax, and a lot of the other ones that you've seen, horned dinosaurs and duckbills. But when we break the Wawit into different zones, we see that these different new dinosaurs lived at different times. So we think we have three different ecosystems stacked in the Wawit formation. So there's the Wawit on the left. It's a stack of rocks that goes from about 82 million years ago at its base to about 77 million years ago at the top. And we have three different windows into dinosaur evolution within the Wawit formation. Again, we can compare these, which is really powerful. So we can compare the top uh, fauna of the Wawit to some of the rocks up in Alberta, up in Canada, and we could compare the bottom to some of the other rocks up in Canada. So this is really powerful for us to test some of those ideas of dinosaur regionalism or endemism. And this is all brand new stuff. So this is still really early in what we're understanding, but we have really cool new fossils. This is the dome, the top of the head of a little dome-headed dinosaur. This is what these dome-headed dinosaurs look like. And I'm working with some colleagues on describing two new dome-headed dinosaurs from the Wawit, from different parts of the Wawit. I'm also working with colleagues at the University of Utah on two new horned dinosaurs, one from the top and one from the bottom of the Wawit. 
And just last spring, we uncovered this really amazing specimen that was discovered by the BLM paleontology program. This is an articulated, really large duckbill dinosaur. And what was neat about this site, it was our articulated tail. So over on the right is the tail bones, um, all in position, heading toward the hips. We had the complete leg curled up under it. And then the, the skeleton stopped. And the little blobs that you see at the top left, so you see three little mounds behind the workers there. Those are actually coprolites or fossilized feces of a gigantic crocodile, probably related to that dinosuchus that we saw in that picture attacking a tyrannosaur. So what we think happened was this dinosaur was pulled apart, ripped apart, and only the back half survived the, the scavenging of this big crocodile. So here you see the parts that we have uh, reconstructed on the skeleton. So we have the leg and the, the tail. So to this point, based on these new discoveries, we have seven new dinosaurs that we already know about from the Wawik Formation. Again, these are distributed through three different biotic zones, so it's three different ecosystems. But we're going from five dinosaur, known dinosaurs to an additional seven. So this new dinosaur formation is really at the cutting edge of discovery. And then finally, some of our work in New Mexico is helping us fill this in as well. This is called the Fruitland and Kirtland Formation Group. It's in northwestern New Mexico. So if you've ever been to Chaco Canyon or that area, this is the rocks around, around Chaco Canyon. And by far the most common dinosaurs are a horned dinosaur called Pentaceratops that you see there in the center. What's really neat about the Kirtland is that we can compare this to other southern units. And what we're seeing is generally a, a southern biota emerge. This is what the rocks of the Kirtland and the Fruitland look like. Really beautiful badlands. And to this point, we've made some really neat discoveries that are helping us fill in what's going on with dinosaurs from this time period. This is a new skull, only the second ever discovered of a dinosaur called Parasaurolophus cerdocristatus. And its crest was a long tube, but it kind of drooped in the back. And so we're working on this new discovery right now. It's by far the best preserved uh, crest of any of these two crested dinosaurs. And we have really neat skulls of things like uh, a new uh, uh, tyrannosaur. So this is the upper jaw of a new tyrannosaur. And just last year at this time, we went down, even though it was super hot, and discovered a really cool new uh, raptor dinosaur. So it's hard to see, but near the paintbrush in this scene is the femur, the, the thigh bone of a new raptor dinosaur coming out of the ground in the Fruitland Formation. And what we can do with all of these new discoveries in Laramidia is stack them up and see how dinosaurs change. And so each of these stars, if I drag them over to the left, represents a different dinosaur ecosystem at different time periods. So we can look at dinosaur ecosystems from 82 million years all the way to almost 72 million years ago based on these new discoveries that we're working on here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And what's really cool is we're not just finding the dinosaurs, like I said, we're painting a really complete picture all the way down to the little insect damage on the leaves. So if you look at the leaves in this scene, you see little holes and stuff. Just like you'd see if you went to a rainforest today, insects are chewing away at the leaves and we get that evidence all the way back in time over 20 million or uh, 76 million years ago. So with that, I want to see if you guys have questions about what I just talked about or other questions about dinosaur discoveries that you're excited about. All right, I think it is indeed time to take some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and stop your screen share and pop on and say, hi, everybody. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And today I'm here to direct your questions to Dr. Joe Sertich, who is our curator of dinosaurs. And one of the first ones that I, I saw pop in, always one that we seem to get whenever we do a presentation about paleontology, is one about how did you get your job? Um, this specific comment comes from Aaron, who has a 10-year-old, who I suppose was supposed to start volunteering in just the few weeks before the museum closed to the public, of course, to stop the spread of COVID-19 um, and is a little bit bummed out. So what sort of schooling or, I don't know, self-education would you recommend for someone who's interested in being a paleontologist someday? Yeah, so if you're excited about paleontology and you think that this might be the career for you, I'm just a kid that never grew out of dinosaurs myself. I've always loved dinosaurs. I always knew I wanted to do something related to dinosaurs. Uh, you have to really focus on studying two different aspects of science, the biological side, so understanding animals um, and understanding ecosystems, and then also the geological side, so understanding rocks and what we can learn from rocks is really important.
But there are a lot of other skills that go into being a paleontologist that uh, even when I was growing up, I didn't realize. One of the biggest is writing. You have to be a really good writer uh, to write things like scientific papers, but also general papers. So things like books and, and other things that um, really excite the public about dinosaurs and paleontology. So all of that, all of that combines into being a really well-rounded paleontologist. And for me, it took, um, let's see, about seven years of graduate school to get to where I am. So there's a lot of schooling involved. Good advice, good information. Um, I still see some questions are starting to trickle in. Keep them coming, folks. Um, for now, I wonder, Dr. Sertich, what do you personally think is an unanswered question in paleontology? Or maybe the next, I guess, if we were talking about space, we might say the final frontier, things that are still unexplored. Well, so in terms of un, unanswered questions, um, one of the big ones that's still being worked on, that's been worked on for the last 30 years or so, is the extinction of dinosaurs. What caused the extinction? And this is still a topic of major debate within science. Was it an asteroid or was it volcanoes causing a, a gradual decline in dinosaurs and eventual extinction? So that's an area that's still being heavily researched. And some of our researchers at the Denver Museum are really focused on that right now. So. Dr. Tyler Leeson and Dr. Ian Miller are two of our paleontologists really focused on why dinosaurs went extinct and what happened uh, after they went extinct. So what's the recovery of life on Earth like? So I think that's right now one of our biggest questions still out there in dinosaurs. You can learn a lot more about the work that those two paleontologists have been working on the last several years, really at coloradosprings.dmns.org. Uh, great place to go and learn and explore a little bit more about the recovery of the earth after that big event. We have time for just a couple more questions before we wrap up today. Josh is wondering, I know there were larger oviraptorids like Anzu in the formations in South Dakota, but were there any oviraptorids like Gigantoraptor that we know lived in Laramidia or anywhere in what would become North America? Uh, first of all, wow, Josh, way to test me on my dinosaur pronunciation today. Yeah, so the raptor dinosaurs are really diverse and include a group called the oviraptor or canignathids. Um, they have uh, more or less toothless, toothless, toothless beaks and kind of a chicken-like crest on the head, uh, really big grasping hands. And the one you're talking about, Gigantoraptor, is this huge version that's known from Asia during the Cretaceous. Uh, the ones that live here in the Rocky Mountain West get quite large, so one from the very end of the time of the dinosaurs called Anzu is quite large, about the size of an ostrich, so a really big animal. Uh, there's one from the Caparoids that's known from just a hand called Hagriffus, which is about the same size, maybe a little smaller than Anzu. But we don't yet have evidence of those super giant ones like we have from Asia. Although at this point, uh, with all the new discoveries, there's a new discovery of a, of a dinosaur coming out almost weekly. It wouldn't surprise me if eventually we find one of those gigantic oviraptors, so a true giant chicken, if you will. Giant chicken. That, uh making me a little bit hungry. Maybe it's just because it's lunchtime, but it's also quite a good visual. A question from Mary Ann. Uh, we talked a lot today about dinosaurs that lived on the western side of the interior seaway. Were there dinosaurs on the eastern side? Yeah, so when the seaway split North America into Laramidia on the west, the other landmass is called Appalachia to the east, and that includes a lot of the east coast states all the way through the, the eastern Great Plains states. Uh, the big issue with finding dinosaurs on that continent is we haven't lifted those rocks to the surface in most places. So there are a couple of spots where those rocks are exposed. Um, that includes some places in the east coast near New Jersey and also some areas of the southern Appalachian region down by Alabama. Uh, and we do have a little window into that time period from those, but by and large the rocks that host those dinosaur ecosystems are buried underground. And so this wasn't a good time for burying dinosaur ecosystems and then um, here in the Rocky Mountain West, we're really lucky because the mountain building lifted all of those, all those rocks, the pages of that book, to the surface for us to study. And we just haven't had a lot of recent mountain building in the east to lift those rocks up for us. So those mountains aren't just good for a trip, for some skiing, for a nice, you know, day out. Uh, they're also good for helping expose some fossils from exactly. long, long ago. We're going to take one final question, and then I will leave it to you to wrap it up today, Dr. Sertich. Um, a question from Claudia wondering, how do you find fossils that are so small, like the size of a grain of salt or rice or something really, really tiny? How does that work? 
Yeah, so those really tiny fossils, so the little lizards that I showed you on the screen and even other things like little mammal teeth and little fish come from a, a process we call screen washing. So when we find a really fossiliferous layer, so a layer that has lots of little teeth, little bones on the surface, what we'll often do is just break up that rock that that's coming from, bring it back to the museum, we'll soak it, and the rock will fall apart or disaggregate. And then we run that mud through screens. And that screen washing is able to recover the tiniest, tiniest little teeth down to half a millimeter in size. Um, and that's what really fleshes out the ecosystem. It tells us what the lizards and the amphibians were like, what the early mammals that lived alongside the dinosaurs were like. And that's a really, really important aspect of paleontology that usually gets a um, little less attention because it's not as exciting as a complete dinosaur skull, but it really helps us a lot understand dinosaurs. Absolutely. It's not just the big dinosaur bones that tell us the story of how Earth used to look. Well, with that, we are just about out of time. Dr. Sertich, any wise words or any last things that you'd like to say to our audience before we disconnect today? Uh, just that if you're excited about paleontology and you want to learn more, uh, keep following us at the museum. Um, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. A lot of our new discoveries are being shown there all the time. And if you want to get involved, our vibrant volunteer program is always looking for uh, new people to help us make these discoveries. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time.